So, um, many thanks for the invitation and for those uh, wonderful <coughs> introductions, also to the subject. I wonder even uh, how much it leaves me to say almost, but I, th I, th I'm, I want to concentrate uh, eventually on the special difficulties I see there being in capital markets. I realize that there are issues of globalization and so on which have been mentioned and that markets have uh, limitations when it comes to distribution and so on. But it's the particular focus on capital markets that I want to have today because I understand that you've been interested in the crisis, rightly so, and the crisis really is one of capital markets. So, at least from a UK perspective, the first signs of real trouble came with a, a rather, a bank whose name you probably don't know. Um, it's not very well known outside the UK and doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Northern Rock, uh, based mostly in Newcastle. Um, and it had been a bank <coughs> that specialized in housing loans with a low, even negative collateral. It was possible to buy 125, borrow 125% of the value of, the, of a house. And it specialized also in lending to people who were buying houses to rent to others. And um, much of its capital was raised in commercial loan markets uh, rather than through depositors, so it made it particularly vulnerable, perhaps, to changes in the rate of interest. Um, and during the summer of 07, there was, uh, it, it faced some difficulty in raising its commercial loans. And on the 14th of September in 07, it actually needed a, a support facility from the Bank of England because it was unable to raise its own funds on commercial markets, and individual depositors then were worried about whether they, their deposits were safe, so we had a bank run, people queuing up to withdraw money as fast as they could, and that was the first in the UK for over 150 years. So things were in trouble. Uh, roughly one year later, although in some sense things had started perhaps in Wall Street, explaining why commercial loan rates, interest rates had become so high, um, Lehman Brothers, uh, murder, <coughs> the murder of Lehman Brothers, and that's a, a book written by someone who was working for Lehman Brothers, so really an insider's look indeed. Uh, I mentioned Iceland and, and Ireland as particular casualties that same month. They had very serious banking crises from which they are still recovering. Of course, many other countries then proceeded to have banking crises thereafter, including Spain and even Germany. Many of the banks have not been in the greatest shape of late, it seems. But prior event in 1999 uh, didn't receive a great deal of attention. So in 1933, in the United States, the Glass-Steagall Act had separated investment from retail banking. That got repealed in 1999, replaced by a Graham leach bliley Act. And President Clinton, uh, when he signed the bill, uh, this claimed this legislation would enhance the stability of our financial services system by permitting financial firms to diversify their product offerings and thus their sources of revenue, and would make financial firms better equipped to compete in global financial markets. And I read that as perhaps better able to compete with what was going on in the city of London, because it seemed almost that the provisions of Glass-Steagall were being overcome through American banks uh, dealing through the city of London in <coughs> investment products. And the City of London that had been the big bang when Mrs. Thatcher was Prime Minister in 1986. And from that time, it seemed that things were becoming less and less controllable. And there had been a steady rise in credit derivatives. By 1996, $40 billion and rapidly expanding. 
And the particular security was a credit default swap, which was really a bet that a named party, the creditor, sorry, the debtor, the debtor would default on its credit contracts. And it was almost like a form of life insurance for corporations. Uh, life insurance gets paid if a person dies. Uh, credit default swap pays out if a corporation dies. Uh, and really a form of insurance if you hold the party's debt. You need that kind of insurance. But it became possible for third parties to bet that corporations would, would default on their, their loans. And as John Kay pointed out a few years ago, um, it rather relied on a specific legal opinion. It was never actually tried in a court of law. It was just a legal opinion from one Queen's counsel. Um, so the growth of the market for credit default swaps after 1997 relies on a legal opinion by Robert Potts. This is a quotation from John Kay. In Mr. Potts' view of English law, such contracts are neither insurance, in which case purchases by traders who did not hold the relevant debt would have been illegal because you can only insure against risks that you yourself experience, nor gambling, um, although it looked like gambling, but uh, the contracts would have been unenforceable, although they were often uh, enforced anyway. And so you wonder what they are. If someone who buys a, a credit default swap is neither insuring, protecting himself against possible losses from a borrower's default, nor wagering, gambling, judging that the probability of default is greater than the odds implied by the market rate for one of these contracts, then what is the nature of a transaction? That was John Kay's question. It would seem to be both an insurance contract and a gambling contract and yet, in law, this judge claimed it was neither. And somehow that made it easier for the market to expand without any effective regulation. Had these contracts been unenforceable in, in law, then we wonder what might have happened. Um, there's more on the Potts opinion. I, I, I hope these slides will eventually perhaps go on a website where you can read the details if you care to. Um, a final note, the Dodd-Frank legislation post-crisis in the United States explicitly exempts credit default swaps from insurance market regulation, so the problem may well persist. And we had some parallel developments. So in practice, we had the accelerating liberalization of financial markets, especially for these exotic products. Uh, but something which is closer to my area of expertise is a trend in economic theory toward more and more sophisticated <coughs> models, which amounted to or offered a sort of intellectual support for this liberalizing trend. Uh, increasingly exotic models, including financial derivatives and so on, but focusing on basically old ideas. And they co concentrated on prescribing how markets ought to work, following perhaps not so much Adam Smith's invisible hand as economist caricature of it, as we'll see perhaps later, and the elusive goal of Pareto efficiency. Pareto efficiency is when <clears throat> uh, you, you can't make bet everybody better off simultaneously by a reallocation of resources or <coughs> financial uh, um, securities. So, uh, this, this, Economists seem to be more interested in prescribing how markets ought to work rather than on describing how markets do or do not work actually in practice. And this brings to mind um, a book by Joan Robinson, Economic Philosophy, an essay on the progress of economic thought, where apart from writing that economics is not only a branch of theology, um, she also saw much of the economics profession as having been something almost subverted by business people with the effect that standard neoclassical economics, especially that practice somewhere near Cambridge, Massachusetts, came to accept the free enterprise system and the pursuit of profit as appropriate instruments of economic policy. So 
it seemed that we'd been engaged in constructing a model of a perfect economic system. And this is actually a cartoon in Nature, a major British science journal. I'm only showing you at the moment the bottom half of a cartoon, because that's the complete cartoon. <laughs> Some banker type seemed to be about to destroy the, uh, the perfect economic system. Uh, and it accompanied uh, an article uh, by Jean-Philippe Bouchot, Economics Needs a Scientific Revolution. The thought was, economics is seriously in trouble. Uh, and the subhead was, financial engineers have put too much faith in untested axioms and faulty models of a kind physicists would never do, of course. Um, and to prevent economic havoc, that needs to change. As I say, the author is a physicist and a finance professional, not alone in that. Um, also in the article, classical economics has no framework through which to understand wild markets. And I tend to agree with those, the, those views, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, somewhat later, another article in Nature, Dong Pharma, also physicist and finance professional, with Duncan Foley, a noted economist. Uh, opening text of their uh, article was, in today's high-tech age, one naturally assumes that policymakers are using sophisticated quantitative computer models to guide us out of the current economic crisis. And they note that equilibrium models in current use exclude banks, which may be creating most of a problem, and derivatives, which are also a major source of a problem. And then they write, when it comes to setting policy, the predictions of these equilibrium models aren't even wrong, they are simply non-existent. And as a footnote, I'll add that when a physicist says a model is not even wrong, that's somehow the ultimate insult of a, a Physicists expect models to have falsifiable predictions, and if they don't, the model isn't even wrong. <laughs> um, so I'll turn next to Ben Bernanke and an address <clears throat> um, concerning systemic risk and financial reform. He had a plea for fundamental reform. At the same time that we are addressing immediate challenges, it is not too soon for policymakers to begin thinking about the reforms to the financial architecture, broadly conceived, that could help prevent a similar crisis from developing in the future. We must have a strategy that regulates the financial system as a whole, in a holistic way, not just its individual components. In particular, strong and effective regulation and supervision of banking institutions, though necessary for reducing systemic risk, are not sufficient by themselves to achieve this aim. So here's a sort of research agenda that these various uh, quotes suggest. If our models of financial markets are not even wrong, as a physicist would say, what should we do about them? Now, science adjusts theories to explain the facts, and that's admirable when you're trying to understand the facts, and that's presumably what Farmer and Foley had in mind. Engineers, like I mentioned Al Roth here, who of course won a Nobel Prize in economics last year, He's interested in creating facts constrained by theories. He's interested in improving the allocation of resources. His work, by the way, may well have saved hundreds of lives by improving the allocation of, of kidney, uh, kidneys for transplants to recipients. But architects, like those Ben, ben Bernanke wants to see, I would say change both theory and fact to accord with each other and to combine perhaps even aesthetic form with function. And do we need a new market architecture, especially for banking and finance? And if so, it's a major task for theory. That's an agenda. I'm not going to really even start on it. I'm going to tr trace more why we may have come to this situation. 
So if we start comparing prescription with description, we wonder why we have no good theoretical description of what's going on. We wonder whether markets should be organized better so that their working is easier to describe and predict. And we have a fitting description that more closely matches a befitting prescription. So in other words, I think, let's admit that we cannot predict what's going on in finance markets very well. They're simply too complicated. But the problem may be that we've, the finance markets have grown up in a way that makes them hard to predict what's going on. And if we had better regulated financial markets, a better market architecture, then we may get more predictable results, which would go along with making it easier to understand what's going on. So anyway, I'm going to consider Actually, in the end, I think it's going to be two different kinds of market setting. So spot markets in which goods are exchanged for cash or for each other. And there, I think, we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. But once we move on to financial markets, especially credit markets, allowing the exchange of goods available at different times, and insurance and other financial markets where risk plays an essential role, then I think we're in big trouble. And that's the trouble that led to the crisis. And whether we can escape that trouble is, what is linked with whether we can hope to escape future crises. So on spot markets, let's actually spend a little bit of time seeing what Adam Smith actually wrote about the invisible hand, which is not that much, at least when it comes to economics. So there he is. The bit you can't read is about the division of labor. But there's a passage on unilateral gains. As every individual endeavors as much as he can both to employ his capital in the support of domestic industry and so to direct that industry that its product may be of the greatest value, Every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. But by preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry, he intends only his own security, and by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end that was no part of his intention. So in other words, here we're getting gains, I'm even going to call them Pareto gains, from unilateral self-improvement. This uh, person is, is pr promoting his own interests and not making anybody worse off. It's a basic idea, so that's... Good, that's, that's the invisible hand. He also goes on to discuss multilateral gains, and it says the maxim of every prudent master of a family never to attempt to make at home what it will cost him more to make than to buy. The tailor who makes clothes does not attempt to make his own shoes, but buys them of a shoemaker. The shoemaker does not attempt to make his own clothes, but employs a tailor. The farmer attempts to make neither the one nor the other, but employs those different artifices. All of them find it for their interest to employ their whole industry in a way in which they have some advantage over their neighbors and to purchase with a part of its produce or the price of part of it, whatever else they have occasion for. So this is about the Pareto gains from a division of labor specializing in the things you're good at tailor at making clothes, the shoemaker at making shoes, and so on. And you get Pareto gains and, uh, facilitated by li bilateral exchange or multilateral exchange. There is exchange, by the way, in this story, but no mention of competitive markets. And there's certainly no claim that one needs competitive markets for Pareto efficiency. Those seem to be later developments. So if we go on to single market equilibrium, then we can look at the works of Cournot, 
pioneering work on the supply and demand analysis using, indeed, mathematical principles. Dupuis, measuring the utility of public works, the area beneath a demand curve measuring the aggregate willingness to pay, and so consumer surplus, Marshall, supply and demand analysis. This is the way that it seems that economic de ideas developed, the major economists of the 19th century. Uh, Varas had a simultaneous equation system represent general equilibrium between demand and supply when you have many markets for many goods which are perfectly competitive in the sense that agents neglect any influence they may have on market clearing prices. Edgeworth, Pareto. Barone, <clears throat> on the beginning of the 20th century, wrote about the Ministry of Production and the collective estate and how it ought to behave as a profit-maximizing private firm should when faced with competitive markets, where by definition of competitive markets, it has no influence over any price. And that idea was in Lange's work on the economic theory of socialism and Lerner on the economics of control. So <clears throat> this is really about efficiency in static models. We have two efficiency theorems of welfare economics concerning allocations which can be achieved by a general equilibrium of demand and supply in perfectly competitive markets. We have a first theorem stating that every equilibrium allocation is Pareto efficient meaning no reallocation can make all consumers better off simultaneously. And we have a second theorem that says, provided there's been what I'm going to call now pre-distribution, following a term that's become fashionable in some circles, a pre-distribution of initial endowments, any Pareto efficient allocation can be decentralized through a market equilibrium. Those are the major efficiency theorems in static models that most economists seem to rely on as saying this is why we should have competitive markets. This is why we should liberalize the market system. Samuelson, uh, the main Samuelson of Foundations of Economic Analysis demonstrated these theorems using calculus methods which rely on continuity and curvature conditions. And Arrow in 1951 had a careful statement and proof of both theorems using more modern mathematical techniques. There was at the same time a discussion of when competitive equilibrium would exist. So Varas counted equations and unknowns, but more modern mathematical techniques emerged in Arrow and De Bruyne. These are Key articles, by the way, that almost every PhD student in economics these days is expected to understand, at least at the level of a textbook that explains them in some detail. So almost all economists who are getting PhDs these days learn about this material and presumably absorb it deeply, and we may have to worry what they're learning. Um, De Bruyne's theory of value is somehow that seemed to be the epitome. It's a rather short book, which is it's a wonderful book, but we'll, we'll see that there can be some problems. Um, <clears throat> perfect competition, it's understood it's more likely to work better with many agents, and there are results along those lines by De Bruyne. Alman has two papers cited there, and, and Werner Hildenbrand. So that's the theory, but what actually happens in spot markets? So traditional markets, medieval marketplaces in town squares still exist to this day. Buyers and sellers know where to come to the market square. Uh, a market square has orderly crowds, so it, maybe theft is rather harder. And uh, with several buyers and sellers all located around the same place, then it may be easier to compare prices and quality. But sometimes interesting to look at what real markets do. So an apocryphal market, which is supposed to work with supply and demand clearing quickly, is a fish market, because the goods don't last very long. So you know, the fish sellers have to sell their stock quickly, and maybe the prices adjust to clear the stock. 
So Alan Kerman in the 90s did a lot of work looking at what actually happened in this fish market near Marseille. Um, so a database to which I, or some associates looked briefly some time ago, there was data for about three and a half years, uh, some entry and exit, daily average of 120 buyers, over 3,000 buyers in total, around 17 sellers each day. Typical number of transactions in a day, 225, about three tons of fish, selling for roughly $20,000 in US currency at the exchange rate at the time. Uh, data included the buyer and seller, identified by code numbers, as well as the date, but not the time, the kind of fish, the agreed price, the quantity, and what was observed were not a uniform market clearing price, but widely dispersed prices per kilo. Every kind of fish, you'd see a big array of prices. And evidence that some buyers were loyal to a particular seller, would go to a particular seller and buy from that seller even though the price was very high. Other buyers, however, would seem to search around. Little evidence of price uniformity as required in a standard model of a competitive market. So the model doesn't fit the data in a fish market. And Alan, uh, <coughs> uh, who determines prices? Valras postulated an auctioneer adjusting prices according to a tautonoma procedure, raising prices in the face of excess demand, lowering them in the face of excess supply. But as he wrote in an, an article, economists have no adequate model of how individuals and firms adjust prices in a competitive model and if all markets are price takers by definition, then the actor who adjusts prices, who makes prices to eliminate excess demand is not specified. There's no one left to be a price maker. So another market form is an English auction. And there's also the Japanese auction, a Japanese button auction. But as time is pressing, let me move on to what may be an efficiently run market. Um, Singapore government, integrity, service, excellence, perhaps. Anyway, um, not all governments are run that way, it seems. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so if you're going to own a car in Singapore, you need a certificate of entitlement. It gives you the legal right to register, own, and use a vehicle for a period of 10 years. And these are sold in a government-run market, organized on lines that seem a model of transparency. So here's a website where I got all the bidding rules. They're just laid out there, and they just explain what an auction really is. You outbid, you submit your bids by keying in online. The open bidding system revises the bids upwards at an increment of one Singapore dollar. I think that's about... Um, 30 euro cents, something like that, until the reserve price is reached. Bid is in the running as long as the reserve price is, is um, as that, that price is above the current price. Uh, people drop out when the price goes too high. And the final price is, and I emphasize this in red because it's exactly the right way of doing it, the highest unsuccessful bid, well, that's exactly the right way of doing it, but they add one Singapore dollar, which is typically a small fraction of the price. And, uh, well, you're out if, you, if the price rises above your reserve, unless you, you are allowed to re-enter with a higher price. And eventually, the uh, <coughs> exercise closes, and they sell, what, 10,000 of these... Um, uh, uh, these certificates uh, and you'll notice that if they have 10,000 to sell then they'll look at the 10,000 and first price which following the work of Vickery in, in the 60s gives you a, a, means that you, there's no way of strategically manipulating the, the auction. So that might be how to run an auction, but for a very specific product, a market for a very specific product. So in my remaining time, I'd like to focus particularly on financial markets. So, of course, usurers 
had a particular hard time, it seems, in medieval Italy. Uh, but a bank, which I gather is now some serious trouble, just developed. But you, everybody here knows far more about Italian banking than I do, so I will move on rapidly. <laughs> just mention that Lombard Street is right at the heart of the city of London. Shakespeare, Hamlet, neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. And I should point out that in Shakespeare's time, now husbandry might suggest you look after your wife well, but husbandry had a more general meaning of that in the 16th century, 17th century. Uh, by the way, a recent letter, uh, a barb from a bard, looking at a different part of the same speech from Polonius, suggested that it was wrong to think that Shakespeare actually believed this. Rather, he gave the words to a mischief maker, and, and perhaps we could deduce that Shakespeare was telling us that people who spoke like that were just an ass, but anyway. A rather famous contract in Shakespeare is from a merchant of Venice. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, ships were sent to sea and uh, they were bringing goods which were going to be used to repay a loan uh, for an unusual contract because the, 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 the penalty to default was a pound of flesh. So Portia, the judge, when it came to adjudicating a pound of that same merchant's flesh is thine, the court awards it, the law doth give it. Most rightful judge. This is the person who expects to collect his pound of flesh. And you must cut this flesh from off his breast. The law allows it and the court awards it. Most learned judge, a sentence, come prepare. The person who's going to have his flesh come. Tarry a little. Well, so, something else. This bond of give thee here no jot of blood. The words expressly are a pound of flesh. Take then thy bond, take thou thy pound of flesh. But in the cutting it, if thou dost shed one drop of blood, thy lands and goods are by the laws of Venice confiscate unto the state of Venice. Loan contracts actually feature in a work of 1651, Leviathan. There's Leviathan presiding over the lands of the state. First and second natural laws and of contracts. If a covenant be made wherein neither of the parties perform presently but trust one another in the condition of mere nature, which is a condition of war of every man against every man, upon any reasonable suspicion, it is void. But if there be a common power, like Leviathan, set over them both with right and force sufficient to compel performance, it is not void. So you need the means of enforcement. For he that performeth first has no assurance the other will perform after, because the bonds of words are too weak to bridle men's ambition, avarice, greed, anger, and other passions without the fear of some coercive power which in the condition of mere nature where all men are equal and judges of the justness of their own fears cannot possibly be supposed. And therefore he which performer first does but betray himself to his enemy contrary to the right he can never abandon of defending his life and means of living. Unless you have Leviathan to help arrange, have things um, adjudicate loan contracts, enforce them. Well, I come back to economic theory. So previously I told you about the literature on competitive spot markets, and that was extended into uh, allocations over time and uncertainty. Irving Fisher especially was, wrote eventually about the theory of interest, John Hicks, Value and Capital, Maurice Sallet, Economie et Entrée. So they looked at general equilibrium with dated commodities, and Hicks had a notion of temporary equilibrium, which was equilibrium within each week, 
and what you did in each week depended on what you expected prices to be in future weeks. That was why it was a temporary equilibrium, week by week. And Arrow and Debreu, Arrow wrote about uh, <clears throat> the role of securities in the optimal allocation of risk bearing. And Debreu, in his last chapter, discusses at some length time and uncertainty. And there's a strong link here. I think there's an influence to what had gone on in the theory of games. So von Neumann in 1928 to Theory der Gesellschaftsspieler, which is officially translated as on the theory of games of strategy, but there's a view that says that Gesellschaftsspieler really means parlor games that you play in the front room of a house, like chess or backgammon or whatever. And of course they've finally had the theory of games and economic behavior, which is, by the way, another subject which all graduate students of economics learn these days. But they don't read von Neumann. <laughs> anyway, an extensive form game, like chess, the players make moves one after the other. And von Neumann, in 28, had this bold claim, which I call the normal form invariance hypothesis, so he pointed out that you can reduce the, the game to a strategic form. So in a strategic form, you choose one strategy to last for the whole game. That's it. Each player announces a complete strategy or course of action, or in modern terms, a computer program to an umpire. In fact, chess, you know, you can have computer programs play each other, and there are even competitions between different computer programs playing chess against each other. So what's that got to do with markets? Well, you deal with time and uncertainty by having ex-ante trade in contracts for what De Bruyne writes about, dated contingent commodities. So each contract promises the delivery of a spe specified quantity of a good, perhaps a barrel of oil, at a specified time, contingent upon the occurrence of a specified state of a world. So maybe global warming is not too bad, or something like that. And it's clearly inspired by von Neumann and Morgenstern's approach to extensive games, because each economic agent in this world of De Bruyne announces to an auctioneer, a market maker, a single trading strategy for all time. So they, they determine their, that all the contracts they're going to buy at every time into the future in every conceivable circumstance. And the prices are set for all goods and at all dates and all future events. Everything is fixed for all time. Um, contracts are exchanged, and the economic history of the world is determined for all time. And everybody can more or less go home. Now, ignoring uncertainty or risk for a moment, let's just see what, a little bit of what's involved here. A little bit of mathematics, but not too much, a little bit of algebra. So uh, a discount factor, the beta t, indicates the present discounted value of one euro at time t. And the present discounted value of your consumption stream, so you multiply, ct is the consumption, the amount of consumption you expect to enjoy in period t, may be measured in euros and you multiply that by beta t to calculate its present value to, because euros in the future are worth less typically than euros now. And then you add over all times from now up to the horizon h, the planning horizon. And you do the same for income, the present discounted value of income. Same thing, but with yt replacing ct. And the typical lifetime budget constraint, which is taught to all economists these days, would say that the present discounted value of consumption, plus maybe some bequests you may leave, can't exceed your initial wealth, plus the present discounted value of all your income. That's your lifetime budget constraint. To be balanced on one's deathbed, like in Gianni's Kiki, I gather there that was a, a, a fight over inheritance. But anyway, it seems more fitting for Italian opera than for life, perhaps. Now, 75, 
Duncan Foley and Martin Helwig had a note on a budget constraint, a model of borrowing, because they, you know, the deathbed is a bit late to be worrying about whether you're going to balance your debt, avoid dying in debt or not, to worry about your inheritance and so on, especially the people who are lending to you during your lifetime, because if you look at the, this constraint, it says nothing about what you borrow or lend during your lifetime. So you could run up huge debts during your lifetime. But Foley and Helwig said, no, we, we, this is not really enforceable. So they look at a borrowing constraint involving the present discounted value of accumulated consumption up to time t. So you'll notice that uh, there's a t here instead of an h the upper subscript of a sum. The last term of the sum is t. We only go up to time t, not all the way up to your planning horizon. And the borrowing constraint says the present discounted value of accumulated consumption minus initial wealth, because you're not, you can consume out of wealth, can't exceed the present discounted value of accumulated income plus what you can borrow, some credit facility. And Foley and Helwig said the credit facility at each time had to be the maximum amount, or couldn't exceed the maximum amount that the borrower can afford to repay for sure, with probability one. So in, they didn't have one lifetime budget constraint, it was a sequence of borrowing constraints. But how are those to be enforced? So in a world of multiple competing lenders, you should choose the best terms possible, and then that creates, can create some problems. But uh, this is what w the world is coming to, though. So in the UK, there's been a lot of fuss recently about a company called Wonga. By the way, Northern Rock used to sponsor North Newcastle United Football Club. Now it's Wonga. Uh, and this is their website. Welcome to Wonga. We can send up to 400 pounds within five minutes of your loan being approved. How much cash do you want? And they're very proud of these sliders. You can choose any cash amount up to uh, 400. How long do you want it for? 16 days, this is yesterday. Borrowing, 111 pounds. Interest and fees, 24, 14. What, for 16 days? 135, 14 to repay. So, in this example, the amount of credit is 150 pounds for 18 days. The interest is 27.99. The interest rate is 365% per annum. Transmission fee, total repayment, <coughs> representative rate, 5,853. So this is what's loan markets available in the UK. It just reduces what we have there. We can send you up to 400 pounds, that should be, within five minutes of your loan being approved. Well, if they're doing that, they're not checking your credit history in five minutes. Existing customers may be able to borrow up to 1,000 pounds, depending on your credit trust rating, whatever that may be. Well, I suppose they'd look at least at the records they have of what their interactions with you. But here's the point. Checking a person's credit history properly would you have to consider all the candidate borrowers' other debt and their income streams that they might be able to use to repay it. So keeping track of credit histories is a public service that seems vital to the orderly functioning of credit markets. And here's the conclusion, moving towards, so, liberalized financial markets cannot avoid crises except by solving a collective action problem, the collective action problem that arises in enforcing borrowing constraints. There's a fundamental collective action problem there. Avoiding crises requires exceptionally well and tightly regulated financial markets. Such regulation presumably incompatible with liberalization. Are crises avoidable? Well, remember the perfect economic system? <laughs> crises are probably unavoidable. And if he, even if they are unavoidable, 
Attacks, perhaps particularly if they are unavoidable, surely time to abandon what I would call market fundamentalism, which is mentioned in the prefaces as well. So we need mechanisms in place in order to limit the economic damage that a crisis causes to blameless economic agents. And we probably need to deal with Wonga.com. Actually, there's a story there because Justin Welby, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, who had a, a life in the business before he turned to the church, <coughs> uh, was involved in some House of Commons commission or House of Lords, perhaps, to look at the UK finance in industry, and he had heavily criticized payday lenders like Wonga.com. Then it was pointed out that the Church of England owned some shares in this company, which was a serious <laughs> source of embarrassment, and I think that's been corrected since. So that was another reason why it came to people's attention. Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, for listening. Many thanks.